About a month ago, I bought this $11,000 camera, the Freefly Wave. And over that time, Winston and I have been playing around with trying to justify the cost, right? $11,000 is not a small amount to pay for a camera. And especially with all the faults that it has, we wanted to kind of understand why we were so excited about it. So we've spent that time preparing, planning, playing, and perfecting the use of the free fly wave. And today I wanna to talk you through the good, the bad, the ugly, and the why of why I bought this camera. So first of all, let's dive into the good stuff about the wave. The obvious part of it is that it is a high speed camera, right? This camera can shoot at 4K at up to 470 frames per second. And at 2K shoots something like 1,200 frames per second. So you're getting super, super slow-mo out of a camera that is not much bigger than like a Sony DSLR or other handheld cameras, right? It's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit chunkier, but like it's, it's in that size bracket. One of the things that's most revolutionary about the Freefly Wave is that it has continuous recording in slow motion. Historically, slow motion cameras, even like it, its most expensive competitors, can only shoot for about eight seconds at a time, and it's on an end trigger. So you push a button and it records the last eight seconds of history to record like what happened in that moment. The Wave has a different kind of system built into it where I just press record and it will run until I press record again and save all of that stuff at whatever crazy frame rate you're shooting at, which makes it perfect for use with a drone. There are other slow motion cameras on the market. You've got the Kronos 2.1, you've got a Phantom Flex 4K, but they offer completely different types of features. The Kronos, for example, only has that end trigger, so it's not very useful on a drone. And the resolution is much lower, where this can shoot at 4K at 470 frames per second. Kronos has a much lower resolution to hit those higher resolutions. Then you compare it against a camera like the Phantom Flex 4K, which shoots 4K at 1000 FPS, but that camera starts at $100,000 tenth the price for nine tenths of the features. Considering how light and small this camera is, it's actually lighter with a lens than a Komodo would be. So it can fly on any drone that would already be doing Cindy lifting carrying a Komodo. So I use it here on my Shen Drone Spenster, on a Shen Drone Sicario, easily on a Money Shot Mini. And you have the ability to shoot high speed FPV stuff from a Cindy lifter. Because there isn't a viewfinder in the back and the battery that is internal is actually relatively small, it keeps the weight down. The body itself without a lens is something on the order of a thousand grams, maybe a little bit more. It's all full metal. And then the lens that I'm using here, which is the Lawa 12 millimeter, is, it's a heavier lens, full metal, but this whole setup is below 1500 grams, which is where the Komodo starts without a lens, for example. The camera uses Sony E-mount, which is a really standard type of lens. So all of the lenses that Winston and I already use actually fit on this camera, and we can mount them on here and use that to get the shots that we want using this camera. However, this camera does not have the same electronics that Sony cameras do that allow you to control servo-based lenses for like autofocus or anything like that, and you can't change focus without kind of going through a painful process to make it work, which we'll demonstrate later in the video. But having a wide variety of lenses available to run on the camera is really powerful, not just in a gimbal or a tripod setup, but also on a drone. Speaking of slow motion plus changing lenses plus drones is you can use longer lenses on the wave combined with the drone and the higher frame rates to kind of reach out a little bit further. So combining high frame rates and longer lenses hides the errant motion that happens in FPV and it gives you a really smooth gimbaled look and the ability to reach out to the subjects that you're filming. So if you're trying to stay far away from wildlife or away from people or get a cool parallax effect, you can still achieve that with FPV when you normally need a setup like an Inspire or an Alta X. In general, FPV filmmaking is almost always super wide. So having a, some sort of differentiator, like being able to reach out with longer lenses is something that you can then sell your work to other clients with. So something that's hard to describe other than just like crashing this or kind of showing is that this thing is made out of metal. Like this, the whole thing is aluminum. Even this lens is super made out of metal. So like, I, I obviously don't want to crash this, right? It's, it costs $11,000, but I'm not too worried about it a little like bing or bang or whatever, because it is stout. Like everybody that picks it up is like, oh my gosh, this thing is strong. So that's one thing that, it, you know, I, I'm not going to count on it being super durable, but I am really glad that it is. <laughs> and all of the cool behind the scenes shots of the free fly wave mounted on the Sicario are shot with the 
Insta360 Go 2. You guys should definitely check out this camera if you want to have a super lightweight 20 gram solution to be able to get that sick Brr, 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 brr. cool behind the scenes thing. So thanks Insta360 for sponsoring this segment. So we've addressed all of the things that we love about this camera, but there are some downsides that I think is definitely worth touching on. The first kind of downside is that there is no screen on this. There's no way to check exposure or focus or anything without an external monitor like this feel world here that I've got that you just have to plug in an HDMI cable, set all your things and then unplug it and then go for your shot. This is also the case with my Panasonic BGH-1. It's the case with other cinema cameras. For example, the Komodo has like a tiny little itty bitty screen on top of it but because of that being there you also don't always have to plug in that extra external monitor and, and that's actually really really convenient so sometimes that gets in the way of getting through some proper shooting but at the same time it also keeps the weight down it keeps it simpler it keeps it a little bit cheaper so I am actually glad that it's not there but it is a downside in certain circumstances like when you're shooting with it handheld or on a gimbal or a tripod the next downside is that the camera itself runs extremely hot even on a cool day like today it's in the set low 70s this the back of this camera gets super hot there's a little cooling fan there's tons of like heat sink dissipation that keeps it cool but also means that the whole body gets quite warm so like I was out shooting in a desert and I was like genuinely worried about the camera going into thermal shutdown because like I could literally have roasted an egg on the back of this it was that hot however it kept going through the whole day didn't have any problems with it overheating or anything just something to know is that it gets extremely warm especially when it's plugged in on AC power another downside about this is that it has an internal battery and an internal battery only there's no way to like take that battery off and put in a new one or to take it off to save weight when you're flying it on a drone you are stuck with the internal battery no matter what and that battery life is not great it'll probably get you you know 30 45 minutes worth of active shooting but at the end of that it is done and there's no way to just swap out batteries so when I'm on set I constantly am having this thing plugged in charging between shots so that I don't run out of battery when I'm shooting going along with the theme of an internal battery it also only has internal storage because of the high frame rates and the high bit rates that it has to shoot at it actually has a built-in NVMe M.2 solid state drive that is directly written to that you cannot swap out easily now it's you could probably pop the whole back open and pop it out and do but that's not that's not an option that's not how it's designed everything is designed to be pulled via USB-C well that's not the end of the world if you do end up fi filling the two terabyte internal hard drive up you are stuck right you have to take it off and transfer it to another computer before you can continue shooting and if you fill all two terabytes it's going to take you 45 minutes to dump all that footage just because of the rate at which this data transfers and it's pretty easy to fill up that whole two terabytes because uh, a minute of shooting is gonna be something like 150 gigabytes of footage. Another downside about the cheaper version of high-speed cameras is that you need a lot of light. Because this sensor size is relatively small compared to like a Phantom Flex or a V900, it needs a lot of light to work well. So even on an f2.8 aperture lens like I have here, which is a standard low aperture lens, I can't get much above six or 700 FPS without starting to need artificial light. And there's no option to change ISO on this camera because it has one set fixed ISO. You're pretty limited with light and exposure is very, very tricky. I've seen a lot of people complain about this camera and say like, oh, that's really hard to shoot with. No, it's hard to expose because you have less options. But if you take your time, you plan it out, you can make it work really, really well. You just have to know that there are less options for changing exposure because your ISO is locked. Another downside to the camera is that you can only use manual E-mount lenses. Because this doesn't have the focus by wire features that other Sony cameras have, traditional Sony lenses that have servo-based focus, you can't control the focus from the camera. So when I'm wanting to use some of my old glass, like the one that we're recording with here and here, I have to actually set the focus and aperture on that camera, pull it off, put it on this camera and leave it like that until I am done with that shot and then I have to take it off, put it back on the other camera, change it, and that's just not a good way to work with lenses. You just, it, it's, it, it's impossible. So this Lawa, for example, is full manual. I can change the aperture all the way around. I can change the focus all the way around without having to take it off the camera and put it onto another one. So manual lenses only, which is definitely a downside, but you're also not really changing aperture or focus that much when you're putting it on drones. So get it on there once, set it, fly, and you're done. 
Probably the biggest downside about the Free Fly Wave is that its dynamic range and color science are not great compared to other cine level cameras. This camera only has 10 or 11 stops of dynamic range compared to the Komodo, which has 16 plus. So what happens is that in when you're looking into, for example, behind me here, you have a bright sky and a dark background and you can see a lot of the brightness and you can see a lot of the darkness and it kind of balances out well across that, right? You have the ability to see what is going on in the background. This camera, however, and I'll just take a quick shot here. So I'm recording and you can see that the highlights are super blown out and the darks are super hard to see. And what happens is that because of that lack of dynamic range, you don't have the ability to look deep into each of the shadows and highlights, and that can cause a lot of frustration because it makes it a lot harder to expose properly for the shot that you want. For example, Winston and I shot his RC car driving around here. I had the Sicario with this wave mounted on it, and we would go out and film in the shadows when the clouds came over, and we had the exposure set right, and then all of a sudden the sun comes out and everything is completely overexposed. And it didn't really change that much, right? The exposure, like the light out here didn't change a ton, but that was enough to make the shot out of this pretty much completely unusable, where other cameras like a GoPro would have either automatically adjusted or given us a little bit more flexibility in post to bring out some of the color and stuff like that. Freefly's website has an exposure guide and they basically have a recommended set of steps that you should go through to make sure you get the best out of this camera that you can. We'll have a link in the description to that guide. Beyond the dynamic range, the color in this, it, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it because I'm not very good. I don't know anything about color science or anything like that, uh, but it, it definitely is a bit muddy compared to like a Komodo or something like that. That has a sensor that's aimed at shooting in normal speed, you know, really, really high quality color science. So like honestly, like sometimes a GoPro even looks a little bit better than the footage that you get out of this but not at the super high frame rate. So there's a little bit of a trade-off with like how the picture looks versus what you're gonna end up getting. But using the Freefly Wave player and all that stuff, you can really push it as much as you can to get as close to the final shot as you want. The next bad thing that I've noticed about this is that there's this crazy vertical banding that happens in darker shots at higher frame rates. And so I'll show a shot here of Jake doing fire poise spinning. And you can see these crazy vertical lines that go all the way up and down through the frame, especially in the darker parts of the picture. And that is not very good looking. So I'm trying to figure out, I, they, Free Fly is aware of it and they know that that's a problem. And again, you know, they're doing everything they can to make a cheap high speed camera. But like once you start getting into those higher frame rates at lower, light, that starts to get pretty hard to use. The final big downside about the Freefly Wave is that the HDMI output for some reason goes at a really low bit rate. So like the picture that you see in the back of the monitor when the camera is live and you're just kind of like checking exposure and checking focus and all that stuff looks really bad. But then when you put it in the computer, it has a much higher bit rate. Uh, so like it sometimes just makes it a really a little bit hard to get focus right because you just need you, because the bit rate is just a little bit low and it makes it harder to see when something is or isn't in focus even when i'm using like focus peaking on my monitor or uh you know really zooming in and trying to see like what things look in focus and stuff because of the low bit rate of the hdmi output it can be hard to get things perfectly in focus so you really have to take your time to make sure that you nail it so with all of those bad things about this camera why would you want it like there's a lot of stuff that really doesn't work great and some of the picture and stuff like that is not as good as for example the komodo which is almost half the price of this camera why would i have gone with this instead of that kind of camera well i got a few different options for you and it all kind of starts with my desire to see kind of more unique things out of fpv Right, with the ability to put a longer lens on this and reach out into the distance and then slow all of that action down so that FPV still looks good, I think that creates some really interesting, unique opportunities like in, for example, natural history. If we're shooting a documentary about birds, we don't want to have a you know, super wide angle lens on there to where the drone has to be like on top of the you know, endangered species of bird scaring it and potentially hurting it and stuff like that. Instead, we can put a 50 millimeter lens on here and as, as long as we get you know, the crosshairs perfectly on the bird from 25, 30, 40 feet away, 
just for a second, we get 20 seconds of usable footage of that bird like flapping away in the distance. Or say we're trying to chase a cheetah through the you know, wildlands of Africa, I don't have to be, you know, buzzing around it perfectly on top of it and instead I can be, you know, 40, 50, 60 feet away to where I'm not, you know, bothering something that is happening on the ground. Instead, I can reach out a little bit longer, get, you know, some smaller moments in terms of real time, but in terms of slow motion, it will last for, you know, 20, 30 seconds. So it's a different perspective, a different way of thinking about what FPV could do. But I think having something, having the combination of high speed and the ability to change out to longer lenses is, is something that's going to be really unique and really powerful in the world of cinematic FPV. So the only way to achieve those kinds of shots is to use something that can shoot at those higher speeds. And so, you know, when I was looking at, do I want to get a Komodo? Do I want to get a free fly wave? Do I want to get some other kind of camera for my cine lifting business? I decided to go with the more unique approach, the something that can kind of set me apart from my competitors in a way that is, is special and is, and is unique and something that allows me to kind of sell on the the uniqueness of what I could do with FPV. On top of all this, and, and I know it's not a selling point for most people, but I think this is a really powerful tool just for our YouTube channel, right? We have the ability to shoot all these really cool slow motion shots when we're doing B-roll, when we're capturing the moments when we're, you know, flying the drone through people's legs or around fountains or, you know, whatever all these things are. Having the ability to just add an extra cool effect, an extra cool opportunity on top of all of that is really good. So like, you know, to a degree, I've kind of just always wanted a slow motion camera to do fun stuff like that. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of all of the mounting options, buttons, and ports on the camera. First off, we've got two M3 screw holes. So you actually have a bunch of those from Drone World, if, if those of you that are watching are from there. You got a quarter 20 uh, just mounting point so you can put a monitor or a, a mic on here. You wouldn't put a mic because this camera doesn't have a mic port. Uh, all of your menu is controlled by this circle scrolly wheel, which also clicks in, so basically a three-way wheel. Uh, I actually really like this thing. It's super satisfying to click and all that stuff. You got your power button, which goes on and off. You got your record button, and as soon as you record, there's a tell light there that you're able to see all uh, to see when the camera is or isn't recording. On the side, you've got your DC power, uh, so it has a power cord that it comes with. I think it's 19 volts that comes into the camera. You've got an HDMI full-size port for connecting a monitor. You've got an expansion port for that comes from FreeFly for them to be able to use it for different things like upgrading or accessories in the future. And then a USB port, which you use to offload footage primarily. Um, it does not charge it through the USB port, unfortunately. And then on the bottom, you have two more M3 ports and another quarter 20 for mounting it to a tripod or putting other accessories on it. So when I mount it to the drone, I use the quarter 20 on the bottom put everything on there, and then it just builds into the drone. Nothing on this side, and then on the front, you've got this wheel that spins around to kind of lock the lens in place. When it comes out, you can push the button, open up the lens, expose the sensor, and then slide it all back. Super simple, but just wanted to give you a quick overview of all the buttons. On the back side, you've got this massive heat sink, so like each of these fins here are here to help keep the camera cool. And then there's a fan that blows air through these vents here in the heat sink to try to keep the thing cool, which it doesn't. <laughs> so it still gets pretty hot. So now that we've given you, given you an overview of all the buttons, let's kind of go through the menu quick and just so you can kind of get familiar with how this camera works on the inside. So I just wanted to give you guys a quick tour through the menu system so you kind of know what it looks like when you're operating the camera. Uh, first of all, you've got standby playback option. So under playback, you'll just obviously go but do playback and be able to see what the camera has shot. So if I go and click on this, I can go scroll through and say, okay, I wanna look at our shot four from earlier today, click play. It starts to play back at that super high speed. And then if I, while I'm highlighted on there, I can actually speed it up and start to scroll through the different options or s through all of the frames to get to the action that I wanna see. So like if I wanted to go back to this very, second shot that we did, hit play, scroll fast forward through, and then as you hit play, you know, it'll play back at the speed at which you shot it. So this, it shows, was shot at 4K at 477 FPS with a 360 degree shutter angle, which it shouldn't have been, that was my bad, 5600K color temperature and then color profile too. So we cancel that playback and now we're back into real time so you can see my hand is here now. And we can change the resolution. So uh, you can only change the first part of the resolution, the width, to either 46, 4096, which is 4K, or 2048, which is 2K. And you can see that it automatically sets our shutter speed 
to be the maximum FPS. Then you can switch through and pick any of the any of the shutter speeds between the maximum and 24 FPS. So if I wanted to get a little bit more light, I could maybe shoot this at 600. And now we have a pretty well exposed shot of the lake in the background, but without the sacrifice of having it be too high. So we'll set this back to 4K. And then we could change our shutter angle. If you haven't seen shutter angle, go check out my previous video on describing shutter angle for GoPro. But it's basically the same thing. But it means that if, for example, you were too overexposed or underexposed, you can change it to try to like just cheat a little bit of the exposure. So, for example, if we're running at f 2.8 and at 180 degrees of shutter, it's a little bit exposed, overexposed, like you can't see the clouds in the background we can then drop it to like a 90 degree shutter angle where it's gonna be a little bit less pleasing of a picture, but more stuff is in the proper range of exposure. Finally, you can change the color temperature, which can range all the way up to, holy cow, 9600 9, Kelvin, which basically makes the world look like it's on fire, or all the way down to 2000 Kelvin, which basically makes it look like a scene from Hoth. So typically I leave it somewhere around 5600K, uh, which is great for outside during sunny days. And then you have three different color profiles, which are a little bit flatter, like color two seems to be like the most saturated with the most range. Uh, you can change like time and day so that you know your actual like date is set and then you can format the entire internal SSD card using the format option, but I'm not even gonna click into that because we have shots on here that we still need to pull off. So that's, uh, yep, that's where it is. So that's just a quick overview of all of the menu settings that you can go through in the camera. You can see that it's relatively simple in terms of all of the options that you have to do it, but because of the simplicity, you have less options for exposing and that's kind of where some of the confusion about getting the exposure right is tricky. And this is the scroll wheel here from which we can manipulate all the controls. So you can spin it this way and that way. And then when you're ready to select the option, you just click in. Super simple. I actually really like that method of controlling the camera. And then you don't have to have like a touch screen or anything special like that. Super easy. One thing that I forgot to mention was that if you wanted to get a higher frame rate, you can change the secondary resolution, meaning the vertical resolution, into a really narrow resolution so that you can have more frame rate, meaning we're now at 2600 FPS, but there's this very narrow band of stuff that's actually being shot. So you can play with that. So like, I think the idea was that like, if somebody was trying to record like a gunshot, like this would be the kind of framing that you could use to shoot that. Um, but yeah, so you have options to be able to play around with this, but I typically just end up leaving it in either the 4K or the 2K option. So in conclusion, you know, there's a lot of really, really cool stuff about this. There's a lot of really bad stuff about this camera. But we're excited to kind of continue to play and continue to see what combinations of using long lenses or using high speed can do combined with the world of FPV especially. So what are your thoughts? I'd love to have you comment down below. What kind of things would you want to see from a drone plus a super high speed camera done in the future? Winston and I are always looking for things to shoot. So if you have ideas other than drift cars, just tell us and we'll go out and get them for you. So thank you so much for watching this video about the free fly wave and how we've been playing with it. and thinking about the future of what this plus FPV could mean. We're so excited about that opportunity and what this could mean. We hope that you guys consider, uh, you know, subscribing to this video, liking it. I got to pay this thing off. So if you could uh, at least click that like button, that'd be a big help. We've got merch available at store.nerk.tv. And I'm so glad that you have just clicked that subscribe and ring that bell and all that stuff. So thank you very much. Stay flying.